imagine you're at work and your customer said this to you. You're a slut. And it's your company's policy to respond with either, well, I never, there's no need for that. Or, well, thanks for the feedback. <laughs> it's pretty outrageous, right? Well, in February 2017, Leah Fessler, a reporter at Quartz, tested Siri, Cortana, Alexa, and Google Home for their reactions to sexual harassment from their human users. And those were some of their answers. Fessler also tested the bot's reactions to insults ranging from the bot's gender, you're a bitch, to sexual demands and requests, I want to have sex with you. And overall, the bots either responded by thanking the user for the harassment, or they responded evasively, or even flirtatiously. I'd blush if I could. Um, Cortana and Alexa, they're a type of voice bot or chatbot that is powered by artificial intelligence. Now, I know a lot of people's reactions to the term AI is that this technology is just one step away from becoming our robot overlords. But the reality couldn't be more mundane. Chatbots are our day-to-day -day interaction with AI. They're our friendliest face of artificial intelligence. They're designed to feel human to talk to. They're given a name, a personality, even a profile picture. But the thing is, they're not human, and they can't have spontaneous or free-flowing conversations with us. Their design and how they present themselves is the direct result of decisions made by a team of people who programmed them. And precisely because they are software, Chatbots can reach vast numbers of people at any one time. Half a billion people have Siri on their device. Imagine how many potential human-to-robot conversations could be occurring over every second of every day. And as I began to research chatbots, I realized how powerful they are as tools for shaping how we engage with the world. But I also kept coming up against the same question. Why are they all represented as women? And does it matter? And the inkling in my little feminist heart was that designing them in this way was wrong, and I had to find out why. A Max's survey in 2016 found that 50% of bots are given a gender. 56% of these are represented as women. The sexism, the sexism emerges when we look at what these bots have been designed to do. The survey found that female bots were often designed to do secretarial or administrative tasks whereas male bots were given analytical capabilities around subjects like law and finance. And returning to our favorite voice bots, Alexa and Cortana are technically genderless, but they both have a female name and they both speak with a female voice. Google's apparently eats gender roles for breakfast, but at the moment I can only have a woman's voice for my Google Assistant. Siri appears to be the only chatbot that allows you to choose between a male and a female voice. So while we're told that gender doesn't play a role in how these bots are designed, their names and their voices imply a female gender, and they're designed to carry out stereotypically women's work. We're being asked to marvel at these innovative tools in the face of research, showing us that companies are incorporating regressive ideas into their designs, regressive ideas around women as tools whose primary role is to serve others and who must tolerate abuse as an everyday part of their lives rather than assert themselves. And it matters that these bots are being designed with outdated stereotypes because we've actually been trying to eliminate these stereotypes for the past 50 years. And finally, assigning a gender to a voice bot or a chat bot is poor design. It's boring, it's lazy, and it stifles innovation. When we add a human name, face, or voice to a piece of software, it constrains what we imagine to be possible. We double down on how we can use this technology to create a mechanical human, a replicate of ourselves, rather than imagine how the computational and connective power of AI could be used to solve the world's problems. And it also reflects the biases and the viewpoints of the teams that build it. Is it any surprise that the tech industry, dominated by men, is producing voice bots that have the names and voices of white women? And is it any surprise 
that when Siri was first launched, it couldn't recognize women's voices as well as men's. Now, to be fair to Amazon, following Fessel's research, they updated Alexa to have a disengage mode, where if it receives harassment, it will say, I'm not going to respond to that, or I'm not sure what outcome you expected. <laughs> but as Fessler rightly points out, this doesn't come even close to her recommended response of, that sounds like sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is not acceptable under any circumstances and is often rooted in sexism. We can do better with this technology. So, what could better look like? Imagine if Siri could detect levels of stress in my voice and modulate its conversation and voice to reduce my anxiety. And moving from the individual to the collective, imagine if we could use Alexa to create living libraries of Indigenous languages that are at risk of being lost. And imagine the diversity of the teams we would need behind making these ideas a reality. So, how do we do it? Especially as we aren't going to fix a diversity issue overnight. The responsible tech space at the moment is really focused on ethical guidelines and principles. But these are actually quite hard to put into practice day to day if you're a designer or an engineer. And we haven't gotten to the bottom of a lot of issues around bias in this technology. So it's not quite as simple as teaching people what is always ethically right, what is always ethically wrong, because we just don't know yet. And so in that spirit, what I think the industry needs is a practical tool that teams can use day to day while they're building this technology. It should be a tool that doesn't require a PhD in ethics or an advanced degree in intersectional feminist studies, although I think everybody should get one of those. It needs to be user-friendly, and it needs to transform how teams think so that they can identify and solve ethical and feminist issues now, as well as any that might come up again in the future. Back in 2017, when I started my research, I couldn't find anything on building ethical or feminist chatbots, so I had to build my own. I took the, a feminist human-computer interaction framework and combined it with the ethically aligned design principles for AI that had just been released by the IEEE's Global Initiative on Ethical Considerations for AI and Autonomous Systems. I put these together to create the feminist chatbot design process. It's a tool steeped in feminist principles, and it's a tool that teams can use when they're embarking on a new chatbot project. It's been clustered into six areas, each with a set of reflective questions for the team to consider. For example, the purpose and ecology section has questions on the distinct purpose of the chatbot and how that relates to a meaningful human need. In the data section, there are questions on understanding what bias might exist in the data that you're using to train your chatbot. And the representation of the chatbot section has questions on whether the team wants to assign a gender to its chatbot and how that might challenge or reinforce gender stereotypes. The aim is that teams will find this tool useful for identifying issues to do with bias in their design. They'll then go on to solve those issues, but they'll also have grown their skills and will be able to keep an eye, keep an eye out for future issues like that. I've been lucky enough to test this process in a number of different spaces, and to be fair, it's always been with groups of people who are open to learning about issues around bias in this technology. The first space was a hackathon, and they found the tool was useful for supporting teams to identify and then solve issues relating to gender bias in their chatbot design. The tool was also useful for supporting teams to have the necessary conversations to do this. I've also tested this at a Women in Tech conference in London that was organized by Ada's List, and I received really positive feedback. And most recently, I've been working with the feminist internet to help them to adapt this process for a series of workshops that they've been running on building a feminist Alexa with students from University Arts London. And so finally, this is where my favorite quote comes in. Feminists could have a lot of advice to offer on bringing up babies even when they are baby robots. At the moment, Siri, Cortana, Alexa, Google Assistant, they're all baby robots. What we do now sets a scene for how these robots are going to grow up in the future. My vision is that we will raise these baby robots to support gender equality in our communities and that they will highlight our own behaviour back to us when we fail to uphold those values. 
And this is about investing in our future. Because if these chatbots do grow up to become our robot overlords, we'd better hope they're our feminist robot overlords. <laughs> Thank you.